So today's, today's topic, as I was considering and praying about it, I, I, I felt like, I just felt moved that, that this should be what to bring today, what God would have. But at the same time, I got to thinking, you know, this audience is no stranger <laughs> to this topic. Uh, it's, it's not going to be like anybody's going to learn anything new. Uh, maybe we need a refresher, maybe we need a reminder, maybe we need to go deeper, or maybe, maybe we're just in a place or about to be in a place where we need to have heard and considered these words of God. I don't want to do battle with beliefs, but there's a common belief among Christians that God will not give you more than you can handle. In fact, some people think that's in the Bible. Um, you know, the Bible is full of, I mean full from cover to cover, of people who have been in situations that overwhelm them. Uh, we have no doubt. Uh, I know some of you have been in situations that at the time it just, you know, over tsunamied and and we cry out and we beg to God and, 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 and the situation wasn't rectified in an immediate answer to our prayers or in the way that we thought necessarily. And I'm sure that every one of us knows someone that you feel, you know, all of my problems, as horrendous as they, as they seem and actually were at the time or even now maybe, we know someone that we would not want to trade with. I know, and I almost, you know, I don't dedicate sermons, but in just coming back to mind and to heart, a friend of mine named Bill, Bill Kilcheski. Uh, he was a younger brother of Floyd Kilcheski, who was re who is, still is kind of renowned in northern Minnesota as a, as a wilderness man, as a incredible, uh, you know, just, I mean, if you were going to be with someone in the woods out, the heat, that's the guy you'd want to be with. Scrawny, little short, he can lift, he can deadlift a ton, or half a ton, literally, a thousand pounds, I've seen him do it. Um, anyway, he had a younger brother named Bill, and Bill was, uh, I think, about a year older than me, and we got to know each other at SCP as, as kids, as uh, young teenagers, and we'd see each other year by year, and Bill was a <laughs> character, a joker, uh, kind of a dry, sly sense of humor, uh, extremely intelligent. Didn't have a great deal of formal education. Uh, he grew up in the woods himself with his older brother and on Alaska trapping, uh, trap lines, uh, his, his youth. But when he did uh, go to school, he did well, and he then went on to university and became, uh, of course, this is the 60s, guys, late 60s, early 70s, he became an ecologist. That, especially in northern Minnesota, there was a lot to be concerned about. And, you know, he was going to make his life up uh, and, and eventually become a professor. And he was actually teaching as an adjunct professor uh, at the University of Minnesota in, um, in Duluth. He met and married uh, a wonderful, if you, and she was littler than he. So even though he was slight and came up to about here on me, she came, she came to about here, and, and even, his name is Audrey, Audrey and Bill Kilcheski. And uh, life, life was great. He loved her to pieces and vice versa. Uh, he was teaching, uh, he was teaching by day, and by night he was teaching kayaking and survival classes in the YMCA swimming pool. Uh, she had a great little job until they, uh, had their first child, and she stayed home to raise the kids. And, of course, a couple, a year and a half or so behind the first one came the second one, uh, Grant and Cole. And uh, life was just full of joy, full of promise, full of delight, full of love and things to love. And it was great to see Bill as I was going up to the camp every year for about six to eight weeks. It, would be, it was great to see Bill every year. And then... One year, it happened. Bill, of course, like most kids that grew up in that particular denomination, uh, 
had not ever had a, uh, an immunization. And <clears throat> when he and his wife had their children, of course, they had all re- they'd kind of thought through that and realized that that was not necessarily an article of faith and it, you know, that it's a partnership of doing what we can, et cetera. So they decided to have their children immunized and uh, first, you know, the first baby shots type thing. And Bill was not aware, nor was at that point, was there any disclosure uh, that uh, that the vaccine that was given to the baby was live. And so Bill hugged and kissed and got slobbered on and changed diapers, and as he always would. And uh, just within days, they had a canoe trip planned. I mean, way, way, way out into the Canadian wilderness. They were, they were three days hard paddle. There were no, you, there were no motors allowed in that area. It was a total wilderness. He loved it. His wife loved it. They had it all planned. And they were, they were on their third day at the far end of their trip, and they were camping uh, in an island on this large lake. And the island had a, had a rock face like this, about, about uh, eight to ten feet high if that was the ground. And then there was flat and trees and a nice place to put tents and things. They loved that island. So they went to that island. Bill hauled the canoe and hauled his wife and the kids up to the top, set up the tents, got dinner and everything. And that night, Bill came down with an incredible fever. And by the next day, he was obviously in very, very serious condition. He was starting to spasm and then, and then, you know, just all, I mean, all, I don't know even what they all were, but, but uh, it fell to Audrey, this little bitty slip of a girl, to take her completely incapacitated, delirious husband, all of their gear, pack it, break it down, pack it up, get the kids, and somehow get that canoe down without losing a kid or her husband to the water and l- literally hoist, drag uh, her husband somehow, I don't even know how she did it now, off of that cliff and the babies into the boat. And she had to paddle for two days before they ran into a ranger, as it was a national park, who then uh, radioed in a, a, a seaplane that came in and picked him up and flew him immediately to uh, Duluth uh, General Hospital, where he was diagnosed with polio. And he nearly died. He was in the hospital for months. Literally, I think it was two months. He was in an iron lung most of that time. And when he emerged alive from the hospital, he was a quadriplegic. And he only had feeling from the neck up. Is that true? Did he have some arms? He had arms. He was paraplegic. It was partial, but then he had full, full head. And, and so, so you might say life changed rather dramatically and quickly for Bill and Audrey. And of course, they did what every Christian in that situation would do. They prayed, and Audrey prayed all the way down the cliff and across the water. Bill prayed, Father, you know, help me to have faith. Will you, you know, please heal me from this. And months turned into a year, two years, three years. Bill got lower and lower. He couldn't even, he couldn't support his family. He couldn't even go to the bathroom. He couldn't bathe. He just eventually came to the point where he didn't want to be there anymore. He didn't want to be a burden. But here were these two little children that worshipped him and a wife that would be alone. And so Bill hung in there. It got worse. I won't, I won't make it, I won't go to the next chapter, or I'll go to the next chapter, but I won't add some things that are really shameful in the way that they were treated to the point where people who could have helped left them without firewood for the winter. And it was only some people who were, it's kind of like the Samaritan, you know, the priests passed by, the Levites passed by, and it was some people who really had no need or business or uh, at all, any connection, who came in and got a work party together and cut eight or ten cords of wood because they had no income other than welfare, and the and uh, 
the, um, the only source of heat they had in the house was a wood stove. And so people supplied their wood for the winter. Well, what was such a tremendous miracle, and Bill, uh, you know, his faith and, and Audrey's faith, there came this point where he realized, you know, there was some good in this. There was some good in this. And he began to try to work, reach out to help others. And along the way, of course, they also filed suit. We had a lawyer approach them and said, you know, this, this is a real problem. It'll happen to others. You need to, you need to, you need to be a, a, a voice so that medic, the pharmaceuticals put adequately label. And that's where some of our laws now, where you look and you have, you have everything you know, to the, so overstated as to what might happen and what this can do and that can do. Some of that goes right back to Bill and Audrey Kilcheski. I know that because I was flying one time with an attorney who, uh, is in, who was involved in the phar pharmaceutical in, uh, industry and uh, between the government and the, and the pharmaceuticals over this kind of thing. And I said, oh, wow. I said, I had a friend who, and I mentioned, he said, what was his name? I said, he said, wasn't Kilcheski, was it? And I, I said, yeah. He said, you know, that's one of the cases that we study. He said, that kind of kicked it into gear, the Kilcheski versus, uh, I forget which, which company it was. But in addition to that, Bill, Bill got to looking at his situation and found ways to improve it. And he, be, he actually invented what he called the ranger. And you know, it's old hat to us now. These scooters that can go just about anywhere. You know, people are going up and down. Did you have one? Did you ever have a scooter? Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, those are urban scooters. But there are also scooters that you see, you, if you look on the internet, or you may have seen them, that are, I mean, they'll go out on hiking trails and, and you know, they're like a four-wheel drive. He invented the first one. He called it the Ranger. And life had purpose and life had meaning. And even though he couldn't do anything but think and kind of some few movements, uh, Bill, Bill began to find joy and Audrey began to find joy in their lives. They were able to hire a, a, a full-time nurse who would, uh, or two shifts of nursing care that would come in and help Audrey so she could get, a, get some sleep at night taking care of Bill. And... Um, so there was a return, I, and there came a point where Bill just wanted to go so badly and face the, the demons, so to speak, the, that, that haunted him about that getting sick. And he just felt it was, it was something he had to do, he, to, but he couldn't, to go back to that island and spend the night on that island where he got sick and where his life changed. So a group of people began to form around him to make that happen. And... Uh, I was approached to see if I would want to be one of them because I was one of Bill's close friends. So another fellow close friend, mutual friend, and I took off from SEP. We took the time off and went down. And we, uh, it gave me so much respect for what Audrey went through because we hauled that, that man. And even though he was slight, when you are dead weight and can't move, it's amazing how difficult it is to, to carry, manipulate, and and serve someone in that situation. But we did it. We got him back to that island. We hauled him up the cliff. Uh, you know, it was kind of like the Prince's Bride a few times where, where we'd get him up and we'd think we had him all set and then we'd walk away and he's over there on his side kind of like, hey guys, uh, you know, and we'd have to go prop him up. And, uh, but uh, he, he faced those. I mean, he was a, he, it was so important to him and he was so grateful. Um, and we got him back home in one piece and the family the kids, and he continued on this upward, joyful uh, path of, of kind of a new life, even though it was so different than a partial life. And just as the ranger was getting through its patent phase, its, its pre-patent phase into its patent phase, and investors were starting to kind of come around and be interested in investing to actually put this into production, I got the notification that Bill was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. Pretty directly related to his change in lifestyle uh, and all the drugs and sedentary life and things that weren't working the way they should. And, you know, I, don't, I, 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 I can only imagine the conversations that Bill was having with God. And if you stop and think about it, Bill 
you know, is the focal point, but maybe even more of a trial than Bill was Audrey. She's the one that had to sacrifice everything, sleep included, and her life and, and care for Bill and two boys uh, with virtually no resources. And, you know, they just kind of are the icon for me of, of this trials that get too big to bear. And you find yourself thinking over the years, I found myself thinking from time to time, Lord, what are you, what are you, you know, I know you, we trust you, you're, you're the great God, but what's happening here? What's happening here? How can, you know, you say that you will not put a trial on us greater than we can bear. Of course, I, I thought, you know, I thought that was, I thought that was a scripture at that point or what it meant. But, um, you know, it, it, it went and Bill died. Bill died. And Audrey struggled on for years uh, with just the kids and with the burdens and the heartache and the memory and the, the lost potential of what their life together could have been. Well, the Bible is full of people who suffered to that point. That's why I say it's, it's, not, a, it's not a topic that, that uh, is uh, un it's un unusual in our life. I know we can all find those moments if we think back to where we thought, I, can't, I cannot survive this. I can't take this. I can't handle this. <clears throat> uh, David says in Psalm 38, he said, My guilt overwhelms me. It's a burden too heavy to bear. I'm exhausted and completely crushed. My groans come from an anguished heart. You know, there's all kinds of trials of all different varieties that take us to this point. It could be a physical thing like, like Bill. It, could be, uh, it can be a spiritual, emotional thing like David. It, could be, it, could be a, it can be an internal sin that we're wrestling with. It can be a, an economic disaster. It can be, you know, you name it. I mean, it's, it, it's, it's as broad... The options are as broad as life is broad. The problem with, I think, uh, us uh, kind of getting this idea that uh, if this shouldn't be or that God promises he'll, he'll, he, he, he won't let this happen or won't let it go too far, I think it, it's a problem of the Western church. Maybe, you know, kind of when the scientific age, industrial age begin to set in, and humanly, as a society, as a people, we begin to get this idea, you know, we, we begin to reduce God to our capacity. As our capacity grows, there's a temptation to reduce God down to whatever our new level of capacity is. And uh, in so doing, we want an answer for everything. And when we as humans demand answers of God that fit our capacity, we basically are eradicating the wonder and the mystery of those things that cannot be fitted into our box. And that's kind of, you know, the mistake I think that we have and, and are making. And that's the price that we pay. The price that we pay when we do that is that we don't see the mystery and the wonder that might be perceived at times when we, when we are not putting God in a box. Um, you know, Jesus, Jesus went through this same thing. I mean, he, he took Peter and James in Mark 14. He took Peter, James, and John with him, and he became deeply troubled and distressed. He told them, my soul is crushed with grief to the point of death. Stay here. And keep watch with me. Well, our main character today in the remain, remaining part of the sermon is Paul, or Saul, Saul the Pharisee, uh, who was an incredibly gifted and incredibly intelligent and educated man who was driven, was passionate about doing his service to God. <clears throat> he believed that was hunting down and persecuting and executing, if possible, any and all Christians that he could get his hands on. And uh, he was very good at his job. And 
he was uh, busily doing that job, moving from place to place, when Jesus invaded his world and actually confronted him. And of course, at the end of the day, saved him, brought him to repentance and brought him to salvation. <clears throat> and Saul, now Paul, continued, or as far as the energy goes, he simply switched gears and channeled all that energy, all that talent, all that education, all, the, all that network and connections um, that, that he had before, channeled that ambition, because he was an ambitious man, toward the service of Jesus Christ. And Paul was fabulously successful in his ministry. There is no one in the annals of Scripture, in the New Testament, who comes close to the, the, the number of churches that he planted. More importantly, the number of churches that remained healthy and in turn planted and birthed daughter churches, the, 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 the descendants of which exist to this day. Nobody came close to Paul, even... I mean, it's exponential difference. Uh, he was indeed successful in his ministry. He was at the top of his game. And uh, if you thought Paul was on top of the world, or if Paul thought he was on top of the world, uh, he was wrong. He would be wrong. Because we find in 2 Corinthians, as he's giving a little bit of his background, <clears throat> he says that um, to keep me from getting conceited, it's a Second Corinthians uh, 12, I believe, verse 7, to keep me from becoming conceited, uh, God gave me a thorn in the flesh. Now, there's a lot of speculation about what that thorn in the flesh was. And the truth of the matter is the Bible simply doesn't tell us. Paul does not disclose. You can make some educated guesses but none of them are at you know none of them are necessarily better than the other, um, and I think the one that I grew up with uh, more kind of leading the pack of guesswork was eye eye weakness, but there's there's three or four uh, equally plausible issues that Paul may have uh, <clears throat> may have wrestled with, physic physically speaking. But he said, that, and we need to break this down a little bit <clears throat> because. Uh, to keep me from getting conceited, God gave me a thorn in the flesh. Now, this phrase, uh, the phrase in this passage is a, is a very specific use in Greek. And in order to kind of grasp this, I, I think we need to, I need to back off. We need to kind of picture this a little bit in our terms so we can understand what it meant in his terms. Um, just think about it. What, what, can, can you... Can you put your finger on the best meal you've ever had? You know, the TV show where chefs would say, uh, best, best whatever ever. Um, I mean, you can all put your finger on some things in your recent past. Center. So what would be, what would be, quote, you know, I realize that there are probably several, but the one that jumps out at you now, what would be your best meal ever? In where? Pepper steak at a restaurant in the Ozarks. Yeah, that's cool. Uh, Diane, what about you? You get around a little bit. And where did you have that? That it was. I mean, where was? Where did you? Folsom. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah Rick. Oh my word. Dave and Barry, you got one?
What's it? What's it? What's he talking? Which is which of your dishes is he referring to, Mary? Hamburger. Hmm. Yes, sir. Sofredo and spaghetti. Oh, Alfredo or Sofredo? Alfredo, okay. Wow, every time you guys would mention something, of course, I've had like three lifetimes of eating around the world, so in, in one sense, I, I can't, you know, it's, I have I have extra opportunities, so, but everything you mentioned brought something back to me, including the hamburger pie. What about you, Curtis? That's the only thing I, I can't really identify with, given my past. <laughs> but a good homemade bacon, pork chops. Any particular person's recipe or place? Just give you a pork chop, huh? Yeah, Rick. Tacoma, we've been there. <laughs> what about you, Nancy? The best meal you ever ate. Not, yeah, or best food you ever ate. That is really good. They do good stuff. They have, a, they have a happy hour every night, extended hours. And a lot of their good stuff is on their happy hour, remember, it, menu at half price. Still ain't cheap, but it's, very, it's more affordable. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So you mentioned, you mentioned Eileen's Alfredo. You know, one of the, this is by no means the top, the top of the list for me, but uh, it's one of the most memorable, is that uh, when I was a teenager, first time that we uh, that I traveled with my parents and some other people to Rome and the, our, ho our host uh, said let's go to dinner he said I'm, I'm going to take you to Alfredo's well that's where the Alfredo recipe was was invented uh, old Papa Alfredo he was this silver haired Italian with a great big handlebar mustache and he would come out his people would bring out you know do the cooking in the kitchen bring it out but he he, he would come out with two golden spoons that, was, that were given to him by Errol Flynn and Olivia de Havilland, I think, because they liked his place so much. And he would come out, and his mustache would twitch up and down, and he'd, he'd toss that Alfredo at the table, and then he would pick a lady at the table of his choice, and he would give her the spoons because they had lots of the best sauce on it. And he happened to give them to my mom that night, so it's something I always remembered. Plus, at the next table was Roger Moore with three babes. And, you know, he, he wasn't James Bond yet, then he was still the saint. But I had watched him on TV, and I thought, whoa, it's Roger Moore. You know, so it was, a, it was a big night for me. Anyway, we all have those things. Okay, now, I took the time to walk us through that because we really need to understand what Paul was saying. The phrase that he uses... Uh, and a couple of those words, the way they're put together when he says to keep me from being conceited, there was given unto me a thorn in the flesh. Uh, what he's really saying there is what was given to me was the best thing ever. So he wasn't just saying, he wasn't just relating, so here's what was given to me. He's saying, and it was the best thing ever. It was a gift. Um, It's a word that connotes best gift ever. So Paul was saying um, that something was given to him that was the best that it could be. It was, it was excellent. It was a true gift. Now, as I said, we don't know exactly what the problem was, but we do know it wasn't pleasant. <clears throat> it was a messenger from Satan, as he put it. Uh, so... Uh, a messenger from Satan, how, is this, how does this work in this whole situation? You know, this is something that was, I won't say evil, but it was bad that was, that, that was descending upon Paul. 
Um, and yet, Paul says that it, Paul says it was a message, a messenger from Satan. Uh, I'm not going to touch that one theologically. There's no need to. The bottom line is, uh, it was ultimately a gift from God of the best kind. And even though Paul says it was a message from Satan, he's saying it was purposeful. It was purposeful. It was ultimately, however God chose to use evil, it was, it was good. It was not just good, it was the best ever. So when Paul, over time, as we all do, you know, we end up thanking God for the trials and the things that he, that he allows to come upon us and we suffer and we come to that point where we say, Lord, you know, thank you. I know this is, you, you, you know, for my good and all this kind of thing. But as enough time passes, we also say, you know, and it's time for it to go away. <laughs> uh, and Paul was the same way. And when Paul realized it was not going to go away, he did what all of us would do. He pleaded to God that he would take it away. And he says, I did this three times. Now, he's probably not talking about three prayers. He's probably talking about three seasons, three campaigns, probably spread over time. Um, and so this is how we all do. You know, when we have struggles, we go to God. Um, and so faith, I think this is a, a, a teaching point we need to reappreciate the fact that faith is trusting in God despite how we feel and that we hold on to God despite how we feel. Um, the thing, though, though, we really need to keep in mind is that lack of answer to those prayers is not an indication of God's absence. It's easy for us to kind of begin to assume that well, God, in other words, we know God is everywhere, but emotionally or relationally, it's easy for us to begin to think that, well, God's distancing himself or I've distanced myself, which either way, relationally from God. And God is not hearing me because of something he feels toward me or something that I've done or not done that's causing this, you know, and that God's kind of holding back. That's just not true. A lack of answer in a trial and in suffering is not an indication. But faith is actually the sum total of trusting in God despite his silence. Despite his silence. Despite our weakness and despite his silence. It's not a magic silver bullet. And the best prayer we can pray to leverage God to do what we ask doesn't work. So Paul came to the place where he told God, I just can't take it. I can't go on. It's not in me to do the job you've given me or, 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 or live with this burden you've laid on me. And, uh, you know, this is our connection with Paul, the giant of the faith, uh, in that we share from, from time to time in our life, we share this same uh, feeling. And we're, we're probably more like Paul than we imagine. But then God answered him, right? And what did God say to him? Remember? Now, Paul was hoping for the answer he was asking for, which is to heal me, or whatever it was, take this away, restore the previous situation, same as, as we would, you know, heal Bill from this injury, heal his polio. Um, but there was no, uh, you know, there was no desertion on God's part, no callousness. Uh, he was going to do greater things through Paul than Paul ever imagined. Just like he did greater things through Bill. And even after Bill's death, you know, uh, Bill's situation was used to possibly save hundreds or thousands of lives. Uh, but Paul never, you know, Paul didn't know. He, he had no way of knowing that. So <clears throat> embracing our, uh, really embracing our vulnerability is really the greatest expression of faith. We are the weakest when God comes into our weakness and leverages it for the glory of God and his kingdom. And this is the, this is the fallacy. There is a scripture that said God won't let, you know, won't let us get to a point we can't handle. But he doesn't say he'll take it away. 
doesn't say, come to this point and then he'll automatically give you what you want or take away the suffering. Uh, it says something else. We'll, we'll, we'll relook at that at the end, which is getting close. Uh, so, <clears throat> so God's power is most potent. Paul, this is what said, therefore, he said, my, oh, so, excuse me. So when, when Paul pleaded this three seasons, eventually Jesus, uh, God stepped in and answered and said, my grace is sufficient for you. So he didn't get a yes. He got a no. But he didn't get no full stop. He got an explanation. Paul, my grace is sufficient for you. It's enough for you to succeed. It's enough for you to live. It's actually, Paul, enough for you to thrive. Embrace it. For, Paul said, and I think this is really, really, really important for us to apply in our own life. For, Paul said, for, or Jesus said, for my power is made perfect in your weakness. There are some things for us to be, for us to be at a place that is closer to God than we could be through any righteousness or any health-bearing uh, effort we might make. There is a place that God knows, and a time that God knows, and a situation that God knows, where He brings us closer to Him through this than we could be at any point in our life without it. So this is what he says. And Paul said, when he, when he heard that, my grace is sufficient and my power is made perfect in weakness. Paul said, therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weakness so that Christ's power may rest on me. God's power is most potent where we're most weak and embracing Again, not in a loud, obnoxious, self-oriented way, but in that humble, grace-filled way, embracing the weakness. And just being real is the bravest thing and the most faithful thing that we can do. And the Holy Spirit, Romans 8, 26, helps us in our weakness. That's why Paul goes on to say, that's why for Christ's sake I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties, for when I am weak, then I am strong. Paul wasn't a masochist. He wasn't, it was, wasn't bravado, a roundabout way of bragging about all the things he'd been through. This was, this was a humble man <clears throat> saying that when he embraces his vulnerability, that's when God acts both his will through him and his, his love and his will in him. So the temptations in our life are no different really than what others experienced, what Paul, even what Bill and Audrey, you know, that was an extreme, but they're no different in nature. When we hurt, we hurt. When we get to the end of our rope, we're at the end of our rope. You know, when we cry out like Paul did, it, we feel the same. But God is just as faithful to all of us, and he will not, according to 1 Corinthians 10, 13, allow the temptation to be more than we can stand. But instead of saying at that point where we can't stand it, he'll fix it. That's when the healing comes. He said, when you are tempted, he will show you a way out so that you can endure. What was Paul's way out? Paul's way out was a very clear interaction with Jesus himself, probably not verbally, but where it was just, he got a word from the Lord, flat out, Paul, my grace is sufficient for you. The answer is no. This, 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 this uh, weakness that, that, that has been burdening you is not going to go away. But my grace is sufficient and there is a way. That was Paul's. That was the way that Jesus made a way for Paul, not only to survive, but to thrive. So as a person, you know, who over the years has had a front row seat to people in pain, um, I know if, if, I were the, if I were the person hearing your prayer, if I were God, uh, if I were God, I'd do what God did. But if I, you know, if I were delegated by God, I would hear your prayer. 
I would hear Bill's prayer, and I would have healed him so fast. You know, I would never have let him die. And that's the way that we as, as humans think. I'd rescue you. Um, you know, I know how you would answer a loved one's prayer, a child's prayer. You know, this grandfather, I, I, I just can hardly, I can't think of it because I can hardly function when I th think of this grandpa who last week was, was with the family on a cruise and had his little uh, year and a half, two-year-old. You see the picture of that kid, just life sparkled from that little tyke. And he was playing with her and there was a row of windows. They were all very clean and clear. And he had her up on the ledge. But as it turned out, there was no, the window was open here. And he didn't realize it. And she tumbled to her death right there in front of the family. And I mean, how does, what kind of burden is that man carrying? You know, I, I, would, I would heal that if you could. <coughs> but we are not good. It's a good thing we're not God because we would miss out on the transformation of character through the journey that he has in mind. So, in conclusion, we need to pray those prayers like Paul prayed with all of our heart. We need to ask God. We need to, we need to, to supplicate for his intervention it, when, as, as we grow to a point where it's just overwhelming us. We need. It's not wrong. We shouldn't stop praying. You know, Paul should have prayed. We should pray. We should pray those for others. But as we do, we should trust his lordship and sovereignty that he is a good father. And if we'll trust that he will use every bit of good or every bit of our pain, that he doesn't waste our pain, that he'll use it for good and heaven's good and his kingdom's good, um, you know, then that's where we should be. So I know this is kind of an awkward sermon, uh, kind of hopeful, kind of helpful, kind of not, <laughs> a little bit discouraging at, at, at points, but, um, you know, we, we, we just need to trust in that story. And uh, just realize that, that, that God's primary objective for us is not our own comfort. It's our salvation. It's our eternal life. It's our perfection with him. It may not be a life that we want to write for ourselves, but whatever God does with us is worthy of the namesake that we carry, that of Jesus Christ. So let's humbly take up our cross and walk and lead wherever he leads, whether through valleys or whether through pastures. And may our weakness show his strength. In Jesus' name.